morning, good morning, how are you? Oh, what a lovely morning it is. Finally, the, I think the bad weather's on its way out. The jet stream's been stuck so far south, it's been over the south of Spain. So we've had a series of lows coming in from the west. And I think probably the wettest month, uh, more wettest May ever. Although no, well, that's only the uh, 24th. I like May, it's a nice long month. There's, people don't get paid for a long time in May. It's like you get an extra week free. They hate it because uh, they have to wait an extra week for their wages effectively. So how are you? Hope you're well. I'm just going to uh, do a quick overview uh, of uh, what's going on, Wagwan, with me and the Mandem in the dental profession. We uh, dentistry in the news today, NHS England or Public Health England or wherever the hell they call themselves. The uh, you know the people who like to think they're in control of dentistry who really aren't. I've just done a released a survey showing that. Uh, Oh, that uh, some patient, one patient, I think, reported that they might have been told or implied that they might have to wait up to three years for an appointment. So everyone's made that the headline. And then uh, of the uh, the rest of them on the NHS, only 25% go regularly. 75% uh, of them think that it's too expensive. Like, I mean, this could have come out of the uh, early 80s. Or the, or the late 80s, this uh, this uh, survey. And and frankly, I'm gobsmacked. I'm gobsmacked. I am smacked in the gob about this survey. I just don't understand how these people could be so dumb, you know? They're like, um, let me just give you like the idiot's guide as to why we are where we are, because when you read the report and you're trying to look between the lines, you're trying to work out what, you know what Ken Weech always used to say, the government never publishes anything, and never, never asks a question if it doesn't already know the answer. And so you have to say, well, the people who publish this report, what is it they're going to do that they're using this report to justify? And so reading this report uh, in, in, in a sort of a, what is this report designed to justify way, um, seems to me it's sort of setting dentistry up to become free of free at the point of delivery because I think uh, the uh, the poison dwarf in Scotland Sturgeon is is uh, going to do that because their socialist paradise that they live in up there is uh, uh, you know thanks to the uh, possession of lorries going up the M1 containing money from the South East um, you know, I think she's already uh, on track to make dentistry free of charge up there. And so that's going to make it very difficult for the uh, statists, the uh, centralists in the south, to argue that uh, dentistry is not part of the health service. And, it, and it, you know, because it has, there, there has been a massive shift towards making it a central part of the health service, um, which I'll explain in a minute. So broadly speaking, how, how did it all happen? Well. Um, all you need to know really, the bare bones of the argument, is that... is that when I qualified in the early 80s, uh, dentistry was a... Uh, we were all self-employed subcontractors. And so basically dentistry was a service provided by the free market. And uh, when you qualified, basically you had to decide uh, where you wanted to qualify, uh, where you wanted to practice. You, you set your practice up, you chose an area that you thought there might be high demand. You uh, went to the bank, you got a massive loan secured on your future income. You uh, bought the premises at your own risk. Uh, you employed the staff at your own risk. You paid for your own materials. You paid for your own lab bills. Um, and in return, you were able to provide dentistry to the state at a price that they could afford because you were bloody efficient. I mean, in some ways, we, we were too efficient, you know. We were saving too much in the way of costs. You know, we got to the point where people were reusing the mouth suckers and stuff like that. And, 
uh, <clears throat> and dentists didn't buy anything that they they bought something if it contributed towards the efficiency of the practice then they would buy it but if it didn't you know such as a, a slightly more expensive alginate or whatever then there was more than they needed then then they wouldn't buy it now fast forward to uh, 2004 or whenever the last uh, the latest new contract came in Uh, the system was entirely changed, and it was a, a changed by a partnership between two people, the chief dental officer called Barry Cockroft and a senior civil servant called Chris Audrey. And the two of them worked very closely together to come up with a system that was much less efficient and uh, rewarded dentists less. Um, and this was deliberate. It was because uh, it was decided that dentists were uh, trousering to far too much profit by being uh, by working in the free market and being very successful, um, and so what they wanted was a system that uh, rewarded dentists less for productivity, in effect. So they brought in this stupid uh, three bears porridge system of UDAs, units of dental activity, where uh, dentists could only claim one of three fees depending on whether the course of treatment he was doing was small, medium, or large, and. Uh, and so the dentist then started doing the minimum necessary to be able to claim the fee for a particular course and not, not all the work they needed doing necessarily as they had done under the old scheme. Now, I mean, this had some knock-on effects. I mean, one of them was the absolute decimation of the uh, uh, laboratory, dental laboratory industry under the leadership of Richard Thomas, who accepted a seat on the board of the General Dental Council at the time. Um, and, uh, and uh, as a result of the changes, the uh, laboratory industry pretty well sort of disappeared uh, because there wasn't a demand for large volume, you know, low, low cost, low quality, repeat restorative work like crowns and bridges and dentures that there had been under the old system. Now, from that point onwards, dentistry was pretty much nationalized insofar as uh, the dentist was told uh, where he could practice, where he couldn't practice. He was told which patients he could see, which patients he couldn't see. And how many of them he could see. Uh, the, you know, the, uh, the contract, he the, had a contract for a capped amount of work. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, uh, he was told um, how much he, he had to charge. So, so, so there you've got nationalisation effectively of the, um, the means of production. Well, uh, the, the things that weren't uh, nationalised were of course the things that still bore the risk. So for example the risk of buying, uh, um, uh, selecting and paying for the premises, the um, paying for the materials, and uh, equipment and also paying for the staff. So those weren't nationalised. <laughs> Which left the dentist with a massive great uh, risk in terms of their income and, and uh, an equally high, if not higher, risk in terms of their outputs. And so, you know, quite surprisingly, very large numbers of dentists said, no, we're not going to up with this, we will not put. And so, of course, they went off into the private sector. Now. The problem with the uh, collectivists is that uh, having seen the collapse of NHS dentistry and to be quite clear the collapse is because they moved from a market-based system which was very efficient, very responsive, very lean and mean and uh, which subcontracted dentistry to the National Health Service at a very reasonable cost, large amounts of it as well, um, to a system where it's um, centralised and micromanaged and, and controlled from Richmond House. And <clears throat> what has happened, of course, is there's been a collapse of provision because uh, <clears throat> my favourite saying, which is that everything that uh, the government touches turns to shit, and sure enough, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> there's, um, you know, there's been a collapse. And they're always, it, it was a slow collapse, and it's taken 15 years or so. 
<coughs> Dear me. I tend to shout because I'm in the car. And I don't do much public speaking, so this is why I'm coughing, because my <coughs> my vocal cords are not really practised. So, um, <coughs> yeah, so what happens is the collectivists have come up with the... Um, with, with this cockamamie system which is collapsing and, and was collapsing at slow speed and then um, <clears throat> what happened was along came Covid which basically accelerated the collapse because it highlighted the problems in the, the system of provision and and it highlighted them quickly for, so uh, the uh, two requirements or the one requirement if you like that every surgery should remain vacant for 15 minutes or 30 minutes after every filling or every aerosol generating procedure like a scaling. The sonic scaling or a filling, you have to leave the surgery empty for 15, 30 minutes afterwards. Well, I mean, this drives a complete coach and horses through uh, the NHS uh, clinical and financial models. And <clears throat> basically it just killed, it just killed NHS dentistry. And the only way that they were able to um, maintain the workforce was to can keep them on full pay even though they weren't doing uh, any dentistry well that was done on the basis of a promise that they wouldn't take advantage of this you know seize the opportunity to go private and of course uh, you know that's uh, after several months of this I think it's being honored in the breach now because uh, one of the things that the uh, uh, public health England or wherever they are is uh, complaining about is the fact that patients are being told that um, they can have their work done quickly if they go privately but they can't have it done if they uh, have it done on the NHS and this is a uh, you know this is scratching open an old scab uh, from 20 30 years ago about uh, and this is why written treatment plans were brought in originally because uh, there was the patients are complaining that they didn't know or weren't being told that their treatment could be done on the health service uh, but um, they were being misled into thinking that they had to have all or part of it done privately well uh, now uh, that's coming you know we're, we're seeing we're seeing that back in spades now I think that you know to, to claim that a cost of 282 pounds for effectively what what used to cover a, a three or four unit five unit bridge or a, a denture full dentures uh, part dentures chrome dentures uh, <laughs> any number of fillings any number of root treatments any number of extractions relines hygienist treatment over any number of visits all the x-rays checkup etc etc 282 pounds and based Bearing in mind that I think it's uh, half of all NHS treatments are done are now free of charge, and um, so for the people who aren't aren't free of charge, you know, I mean, you can take now that the pubs have reopened, you can take six people, you know, if Granddad has a birthday, and Granddad goes out with his two children and their husbands or wives and the kids. Uh, so there's six adults and let's say two children and two babes in arms. You're going to pay north of 282 quid for that for that meal anyway. You know. Uh, so to say that uh, that's that's excessive for a uh, full course of dental treatment, it just ignores the economic reality. But then that's what statists do. That's what collectivists do. They do. They they quite happily ignore the economic reality. So at the end of the day, they're um, <clears throat> they very much believe that uh, the problem with uh, state control is that it only fails if there's not enough of it. You know, there's nobody saying that the system would work again if only we went back to the days when dentists were self-employed subcontractors. No, uh, everyone's saying that it's these greedy private dentists that are offering to, you know, that are making enough of a profit to pay the bills and then still do work at uh, reasonably short notice, uh, they're the ones that are undermining the National Health Service. If only these guys would work for the National Health Service instead of privately, uh, everyone would be able to have a dentist, which is absolute bullshit. 
I mean, I've said before, I think the private sector is uh, uh, acts as the emergency service to the NHS. Uh, we, we are, it sounds to me as though we're going to get an increasing number of phone calls from NHS patients who now can't find an NHS dentist. And the idea that making dentistry free, which is what seems to be behind this initiative, on the basis that it's part of the health service, which, it, you know, post nationalisation, it, it, you could probably argue it has become far more part of the National Health Service. For example, um, if a patient doesn't turn up now on the National Health Service, you're not allowed to charge them for the wasted time in the same way as if you have a hospital appointment and, and you don't turn up, you can't be charged for wasting time. You may be slung out of the, health, the hospital and, and referred back to your GP. And so what they do is they do that on the basis that uh, you know, they cause you a lot of inconvenience. If you inconvenience them, then they inconvenience you. But then obviously all they do is they just inconvenience your GP because he's got to write another referral letter. <coughs> and then they've got to make you another appointment for which they then still can't charge you if you don't turn up, blah, blah, blah. But what, what on earth do they think is going to happen to demand if they make dentistry free of charge? You know, they've got a problem of excess demand, you know, because the supply side has completely collapsed due to their mismanagement. And, and what they're doing, what is their solution, is to make dentistry free of charge. And I still don't think what they think dentistry costs. I don't think, you know, <laughs> I mean, 20 years ago I would have had trouble doing a complete course of treatment. 40 years ago, I would have had trouble doing a complete course of treatment for someone for an average uh, cost uh, of, of, of an average fee of 282 pounds. I do not see how they think in two, 2021, 2021, right, that, uh, that this argument that uh, dental charges are excessive in any way at all uh, is, I mean, the only reason, the only way you can argue that is if you think it should be free, you know. You can't, if you think it should be chargeable and you look into how much it costs and, and uh, how much you should be charging, then you'd have to conclude that NHS dentistry is a miracle. It's a, it's a miracle you can get any NHS dentistry at all for what NHS dentists get paid. And I won't tell you how they achieve that miracle. Because that is a state secret. That is nobody. It's a, that's a, our dirty washing, and we don't want that washed in public. But, but, uh, but the answer to more, uh, you know, to the failure of collectivism and micromanagement is not more uh, collectivism and more micromanagement. But unfortunately, I think that's uh, that's probably pretty much what we're going to get. Anyway, okay. It's been nice talking to you. I'll talk to you again soon. Bye.